This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is John Richardson. He's a lawyer for U.S. persons abroad. He's an expert in American tax law based in Toronto, Canada. This episode is going to be jam-packed with information that would otherwise cost you large amounts of money. I think John charges 575 bucks for a one hour call with him. So this can be a value packed episode. Uh, Absolute expert in his field, Mr. John Richardson. Welcome to the show. Well, hello there. Looking forward to our discussion. Absolutely. I feel like my intro did not do, uh, do you justice? Do you want to give a bit of a background on who you are, John? Oh, I think you pretty much summed it up. Uh, I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> it's not who I am. You can judge who I am. I guess, <laughs> but what I do is I help uh, U.S. citizens and green card holders. In the case of U.S. citizens who are afflicted, afflicted with place of birth anxiety, <laughs> uh, solve their problems or at least mitigate them. And I think the the way I originally found you was that you're involved in uh, the accidental American movement a little bit and sort of, uh, the, the fight against citizenship based taxation, which are kind of two different movements, but kind of one in the same. Do you kind of want to explain what an accidental American is? Um, you know, I'll give it a try. Uh, I don't think anybody accidental American is somebody you recognize when you see it, but it's hard to define. Uh, first of all, the term accidental American has no existence in any U.S. law whatsoever. It's generally understood to be somebody who is either born in the United States uh, with, almost, with no uh, economic ties to the United States whatsoever. Generally, I think these are people who are understood to have, you know, left before the age of majority, usually with their parents, um, or they're people who were born to a U.S. citizen outside the United States and, uh, you know, decided they were a U.S. citizen, you know, from that point on. Um, I would add that there are a few accidental Americans who are happy with their American citizenship, if somebody calls himself an accidental American, chances are very, very good that they are experiencing some issue uh, somewhere uh, with mm-hmm. the problem of being uh, an American citizen. And my understanding is that in Canada alone, there's probably upwards of a half a million accidental Americans uh, by one me- metric where it's just Canadians where one of their parents are American. And even though maybe they were born in Canada, they uh, have the right to U.S. citizenship or the U.S. government would consider them a U.S. citizen, even though they don't have an American passport, they've never lived there, they have nothing on paper technically tying them to, to, to the states, except the fact that their, their parent 
was born in the state, something like that. Does that ring a bell? I think that number's probably low, uh, mm. if you put it that way. I mean, you know, years ago I used to hear a statistic that something like, uh, you know, 80% of the population of Canada lives within 100 miles of the U.S. border, mm-hmm. which is pro- yeah, possibly true, okay, but it's more or less accurate, I think. Uh, partly because, you know, Canada is not particularly well populated uh, 100 miles from the border if you go north anyway. But, you know, there, there's, you know, a long history of cross-border border mobility. So you're going to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who are entitled to American citizenship. Um, I suspect that a very high percentage of them um, probably don't acknowledge their American citizenship. They just don't consider themselves to be American. Mm-hmm. And so for people in that situation, they grew up in Toronto, they grew up in New Brunswick, one of their parents is randomly from Minnesota, um, but they have no ties to the States, they don't have a passport, they don't have a report of citizen abroad, CRBA, I think it's called. Would you recommend those people actually go formally renounce their US citizenship, or just continue kind of like living and existing in that gray area and hoping nothing comes of it? Um, You know, I have helped a lot of people in that category renounce U.S. citizenship over the years. I will say this, that I don't think it's a hugely urgent issue uh, for them. For, for two reasons, okay? The first reason is that nobody, you know, it's the, really the U.S. place of birth, right? That's the problem, you know? It's like the, mm-hmm. the scarlet letter sort of thing. You know, once you get <laughs> that, uh, you know, there's going to be trouble uh, once people find out about it. Now, interestingly, in Canada, uh, passports uh, are not a common form of identification for opening bank accounts and that sort of thing. So I think there's a very, very large number of people in Canada who probably are entitled to American citizenship, have no particular consciousness of it, because there's nobody at a bank who says, hey, you know, we see you were, uh, uh, you know, you're well, you're either born in the United States or you at some point opened a bank account or, you know, any of these things. Anyway, those people are, I think, largely invisible. Mm-hmm. Um, but they do have one tremendous advantage if they want to be uh, a dual citizen. That is that they're dual citizens from birth often. And that really makes them uh, a preferred kind of U.S. citizen. I mean, anybody who thinks that U.S. citizens are equal obviously doesn't understand U.S. tax law or U.S. citizenship law very well. Because at some point, uh, most American citizens living outside the United States are probably going to consider renunciation. And if you're a dual citizen from birth, a dual Canada U.S. citizen from birth, and you know you meet various other uh, requirements, you can actually renounce U.S. citizenship and not be subject to the exit tax. Hmm. So this is huge. And, it, and and so why wouldn't they be subject to the exit tax? Well, so the people who are subject to the exit tax are called covered expatriates. And usually the problem is they have more than $2 million of net worth. And, you know, anybody who's lived in Toronto would know that you can do that just basically through a house and a pension. But there's an exception to the exit tax rule. And that is if you're, one, a dual citizen from birth, Two, you're still a tax resident of the country of second citizenship. Mm-hmm. Three, you haven't lived in the United States uh, for you know more than ten of the last fifteen years. Mm-hmm. And four, you can actually certify tax compliance. Then you don't have to worry about accumulating uh, wow. you know, too much wealth. That's so huge. That's huge. It's unbelievable. It's, I mean, it's a preferred status of citizenship. Um, I mean, it's, it's really shocking, right, when you think about how the United States essentially discriminates against, uh, you know, U.S.-born people who were not fortunate to, you know, be born to 
And and would that be even um, even dual citizens that claimed their U.S. citizenship and got the passport but just never lived there? Would they be exempt from the tax as well, or only yeah, the people? Be a more specific example: which which kind of U.S. citizen? You mean somebody who was born in Canada? To yeah, live- I, I know we're saying Canada a lot in this podcast because you know you're in Toronto and I may or may not have relationships with Canada, but when you extrapolate this to half our audience is American. And so they're deciding where they maybe want to raise their kids. And one thing I've actually talked about a lot in the past is there is, I've talked about this exact same thing about how the best type of American is an American born outside the United States, because it doesn't say your place of birth, birth being the United States on your passport or on your other documents. And so you can sort of get away with not appearing American when it comes to opening bank accounts and things like that. No, I think I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, and I think that people who are thinking in terms of family planning, uh, I mean, I'm quite serious about this. Uh, I think that one of the greatest gifts in this turbulent world that you could give your children would be the gift of dual citizenship. So uh, what might that mean? Uh, I mean, there are people, I understand, I don't know any of these people personally, who will have their, who are American citizens, will have their children born in Mexico mm-hmm. uh, or possibly Canada, uh, you know, et cetera. And I think that, uh, you know, in the last century, I don't think citizenship was a big, big deal, right? But in this century, it is a huge deal. Right, because it opens doors to mobility and things like that. And if you can get your kids dual citizenship right from the get go, uh, you know, you're giving them a tremendous options. I mean, you know, you could make a billion dollars in the United States, you know, if you're born a dual Canadian citizen, move to Canada, uh, you know, et cetera, and, you know, figure out how to run your life so you could expatriate and not be subject to that exit tax. Yeah, very cool. I mean, cool. this stuff is, is really, really opens the door to many, many planning opportunities. But I don't know how long this is going to go on because I personally, I mean, you know, anybody who understands U.S. tax will understand that it's quite possibly the most unjust revenue system ever. <laughs> I mean, you know, it has like seven or eight different tax systems, uh, etc. But you know, I think that this is, I, I sort of see it as a loophole. I don't personally see any reason. Let me give you an example here. So let's say we have two uh, identical billionaires. Okay, mm-hmm. two identical billionaires. Okay. Uh, one of them uh, was born in the United States without dual citizenship. Okay, he had the misfortune to be born to parents who were who trace their lineage right back to the American Revolution. Okay. okay. They were such important, good Americans that they were pure Americans with no taint of any other citizenship. Okay. Straight off the Mayflower. Okay. Right off the Mayflower. Exactly. Okay. Uh, actually, there is a, you know, there is such a thing as the daughters of the American Revolution. Why don't we make it a daughter of the American Mm-hmm. All right, now that daughter of the American Revolution has a friend, was born, you know, next door the same day, but that person's was born to a Canadian citizen parent and therefore acquired Canadian citizenship at birth, okay? Now, the one with the dual citizenship is unquestionably a preferred American in the sense that there are clear tax advantages just based on the citizenship, okay? Mm-hmm. The one with American citizenship only, uh, if he or she were to try to expatriate, could never do it, right? Uh, without being hit with massive, massive exit taxes that, frankly, are getting to the point they're so punitive uh, that, you know, it, it really is, you know, creating sort of a Berlin Wall. So, um, I am beginning to see U.S. citizenship as, as basically a caste system. Okay. 
I mean, another interesting opportunity, this isn't dual citizenship from birth, but it is an interesting opportunity. Uh, you know, we were chatting about, you know, residency by investment, you know, citizenship by investment. Mm-hmm. One of those fantastic programs, uh, I think, available to Americans is to just send their kids to the University of Toronto or somewhere for university. Right. They can get a postgraduate work permit after that, leverage that into permanent resident status and then Canadian citizenship. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And, you know, this can be done for less than the cost of a a comparable U.S. university. Mm -hmm. I mean, why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? Right, right. And if you have dual citizenship with Europe, you can go to university in Europe basically for free. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. You know, I think these citizenships are becoming more and more valuable. Now, to be clear, I think the U.S. citizenship is very valuable. Okay. I mean, you know, it's it's on a par with most first world citizenships. It's just that because of the, the tax and regulatory regime, it's it's almost impossible for a U.S. citizen to move outside the United States permanently and make a life in that other country, you know, where you're actually doing your retirement and financial planning in that other country, because this is where you run into the tax problems. Yeah. Yeah. John, it's, it's crazy. I almost have to put a pin in like three separate topics. So we could talk about being a U.S. citizen abroad as a digital nomad, which you told me offline is, is actually a good situation to be in, versus being a U.S. citizen abroad as an expat or retiree long term, which can get definitely a little bit hairy. So that's one topic. Retiree. That's that's a third. That's a separate category. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe you know, if you want to, if, you know, if you want to tee it up, I mean, we can talk about each of those three categories and how they're very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I wanted to ask real quick because uh, I was just curious: what's your personal situation? Are you were you born in Canada? Were you born in the states? I was. Uh, I've lived almost all my life in Canada, but I was born in the states. I probably would qualify as an accidental American. Okay, cool. Whatever that means. Right. Yeah. So I, I, sorry to cut you off. Good. Yeah. Whatever, the, whatever that really means. The problem with the accidental American movement, which I'm not, you know, I'm well aware of and I've worked with them. I don't particularly associate with it though. Uh, you know, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, see, see with the accidentals, what they're trying to do primarily is just argue they shouldn't be subject to these U.S. laws because, you know, they just don't have sufficient ties, right, to the United States. My view is that that applies to far more than the so-called accidental Americans, right? So, I mean, my view of this is much broader. And I think that the focus on, you know, the so-called accidental Americans obscures the overall issue, which is that the U.S. should not be uh, essentially imposing worldwide taxation on people who don't buy, live in the United States, whether they're these accidental Americans with mm-hmm. really significantly fewer economic ties than others or not. In other words, I think the whole so-called citizenship taxation regime is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Do, yeah. do you want to just quickly, before we jump into the nomad versus expat versus retiree, which I think is a good flow, but do you want to just quickly tee up uh, I think most people know this, so you can do it pretty fast, but what is citizenship-based taxation? Why is it unique to the United States? And actually, maybe like when did when did this come about? Because I know you've talked about the history of how this happened as well. Um, well, let me talk about what it is. I, th- I think that's the bigger issue. I mean, it's been around long enough, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. uh, but the history there, but I think what's important is what it is. Now, first of all, you know, we're having a conversation using the term citizenship-based taxation, which is completely meaningless. You know, it's, it's, in the, it's, it's, a, it's like a, it's a neologism, like accidental American, you know, meaning just sort of a made-up word. 
neither has any particular meaning. So let's talk about what it really is, okay? What, it, what citizenship taxation really is, is claiming somebody is a tax resident, meaning subject to the tax rules, based on the circumstances of their birth and not on the circumstances of their life. Right. So it's like birth-based tax residency. Sure. Something like that, okay? Uh Uh-huh. Now, every other country in the world, all right, defines tax residency, which is what people want to avoid, right? I mean, that's part of what a digital nomad usually is, okay? Defines tax residency in terms of the circumstances of life, meaning where do they actually live? Where do they make their money? Where do they use government services, right? That's generally referred to circumstances of life taxation Mm -hmm. is, you know, it's called residence-based taxation. It's what the rest of the world has. The United States has circumstances of birth taxation, right? Not (laughs) one. Now, Now, what does that mean? Okay. What does that mean? What it means is, okay, and it's very important to understand this, what citizenship, what tax residency based on birth means is that the United States uses that attribute, right, that we're going to tax people based on being born in the United States as a way to actually impose full taxation on people who live in other countries, okay? Now, Let me expand on that just a touch, okay? Because again, now where I'm going with this, the only meaning that birth-based taxation, citizenship-based taxation has contextually is that it allows the United States to walk into other countries and claim the residents of those other countries as U.S. tax residents. All right, that's, that's what it actually means. Now, You know, this can be, you know, a lot of people, you know, try to confuse this or just confuse it. But let's look at it this way. Every country in the world taxes people who reside in the country, including the United States. Agreed? All countries. You live in the country. You're going to be subject to worldwide taxation, number one. Number two, all countries impose taxation on income sourced inside that country. Number Mm two, only the United States extends its tacticals into other countries and says, you know what? We see these people living in your countries, but by God, because they were born in our country, we're going to claim your tax residence as our tax residence. So you see, that's what citizenship taxation really means. Mm-hmm. I think every uh, American digital nomad listening to this is uh, is nodding their heads right now. I'm sure they're nodding their heads, but they have it easy. Yeah, yeah so let's, let's let's get into that. Well, let's start with a digital nomad. Actually, let's start with a retiree abroad. Okay. okay let's start there. We'll move because our audience is probably like average. I don't know, 28, 30, 35 years old. So we'll, we'll let them know what they have to look forward to as they retire. Uh, no, there's a reason for starting with this, okay? The reason is this. Right. Start planning now. Abroad. Okay, when we think about taxation, we think about taxation of the person and taxation of the source of income. Retirees abroad are people who are moving out of the United States to live off their U.S. source pension, Social Security, what have you, in other countries. They generally do not have income sourced outside the United States. So if they move outside the United States, really not much changes for them at all. Okay? They just live outside the United States. They still pay taxes in the United States. They still file the same tax returns. And usually they're they're either not paying taxes to other countries or uh, uh, or the fact that their income is sourced in the United States means they don't. So they don't really have any problems. They don't see the U.S. birth-based taxation regime to be any problem because for they see mm. their situation only in terms of income sourced in the United States, okay? The so American retirees abroad. And that is why they generally don't get excited about this and often are actually hostile to change in the tax regime. 
Okay. Now, let's move to your digital nomad. Now, I think we first need to agree on what a digital nomad is. Uh, my understanding, and I'm not one of them, okay, so uh, my understanding of a digital nomad is somebody who moves to another country and works remotely, generally not making their income uh, in the country they're working from, okay, although they may be. But the point is simply this, that they move, say, from, um, you know, from California to Mexico, to Portugal. Portugal has a new digital nomad visa, so we can yep. use that as an example. Okay. Now, um, they're in a not bad situation at all. And I want to compare an American to a Canadian in this situation because they're arguably very different, okay? So remember that America, okay, claims as tax residents anybody born in the United States right? mm -hmm. or anybody who, a, a green card holder as well. Okay, but let's not complicate it. So, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that they go to Portugal or whatever, that doesn't mean anything in terms of how it affects their U.S. tax situation at all. However, the U.S. Internal Revenue Code has source rules that basically say just that, where is income source? And one of the things it says is that the income is sourced in the place where the work is done. So let's say they get a digital nomad visa for Portugal. They go to Portugal. They do their work in Portugal. And because they're doing their work in Portugal, that is classified as foreign income under the U.S. rules. Mm -hmm. Now, they can manage the foreign income, all right, in one of two different ways. One thing that some of them will do is they'll use the foreign earned income exclusion, uh, which basically means if you have a tax home in another country and uh, you, know, you either really live there or you spend enough time outside the United States, you can exclude up to, you probably know this better than I do, but I think it's around 120000 U.S. dollars. Yep. Uh, you know, in a year, and that's indexed to inflation. And, you know, that's not bad, actually. That's not bad. I suspect that a lot of people make far less than that. And, you know, that makes their tax situation uh, relatively simple, relatively simple, okay? Unless, unless, now we'll, we'll use Portugal as an example. Now, my understanding of the digital nomad visa in Portugal and I may be wrong, okay, but if I'm wrong, let's imagine this is the case because it's certainly true for other countries, is that the digital nomad visa does not give you an exemption from Portuguese taxes necessarily, meaning if you meet the requirements for tax residency in Portugal, which I think is 183 days, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're going to be subject to taxation in Portugal as well. Now, let's look at this from the point of view of the American from California. Well, um, you know, let's say the person uses the foreign earned income exclusion, and then the person would just pay taxes in Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Without having to worry about the U.S. taxation, as long as we're dealing with earned income, all right, to, to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the person could use the, it could include the income instead of excluded. The foreign earned income exclusion excludes the income. They could include it. And then, of course, what they're going to do is they're going to use tax paid in Portugal as a way, as a credit against any U.S. tax on. Yep. But for digital nomads, generally speaking, I think that things go fairly smoothly. And, you know, if we were to compare an American to a Canadian, now what's interesting about this is that Canada, of course, uh, defines tax residency in terms of circumstances of life like the rest of the world. But if you're going to sever tax residency from Canada, uh, you're going to be subject to departure taxes and stuff like that. All right. So it may be that a digital nomad actually takes the position of severing tax residency from Canada, or maybe not. But it's a different issue. The American would not sever tax residency from the United States because the American can't. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's sort of the situation uh, from the point of view of the digital nomad. Uh, probably all your listeners are well, well, well aware that any American citizen living outside the United States uh, has very penalty-laden and extensive reporting requirements for anything 
anything that's foreign to the United States. Okay, so that would be bank accounts, brokerage accounts. The F-bar. Uh, yeah, F-bar, sure. Uh, up until 2017, it was common for Americans to create uh, foreign corporations that were controlled foreign corporations, basically uh, basically to invo- avoid the self-employment tax, all right, which you know, I forgot to mention that uh, the, the self-employment tax still needs to be paid in America, uh, you know, regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not going to be able to do that anymore because changes in the 2017 law made that uh, either not worth it tax-wise, uh, but certainly too expensive from a, from a compliance point of view. But and still... So now, now people do d- dividends and distributions instead of, like, uh, self-employment income? Um, well, that's, you know, that's always an option, right? But you have to, uh, you know, you have to accumulate the income in the corporation to do that. And in order to do that, you're going to have to deal with the, uh, you know, the whole guilty rules and things like that. So I, my generally general view of this is that unless people are making an awful lot of money an awful lot of money uh, i don't think they should get into uh creating corporations outside the united states okay but i do acknowledge that's my opinion um there are certainly people who would disagree but if you really dig i suspect there are also people who make their business filling out 5471s uh, you know, which is the, uh, you know, the very extensive reporting requirements for Americans with. Okay. Foreign yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're, if you're enough money, maybe go offshore. Okay. And, and so just to kind of keep things on track. So digital nomads can leverage the foreign earned income exclusion. They're probably not tax residents anywhere else. If they are, they can do uh, what's it called? Foreign tax credits to taxes paid. And it basically equals out. That's, the idea and and can actually be very beneficial. Uh, I can, but remember the self employment taxes, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. you know that that's that's another big issue because they're high, right? Because that's like fifteen percent, I think. Fifteen percent, it's high. Yeah. However, okay. However, however, um, it is an investment in social security credits, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not a bad thing. I, I mean, it may not seem like a good thing for a lot of people who are digital nomads, but over time. Right. The more you pay into the system, the more that's you'll, right. you'll you know, eventually get out of it. Uh, you know, at least what it, what is at present? I mean, the U.S. Social Security system is incredibly lucrative, incredibly lucrative uh, relative to things like Canada pension plan. And it's not only the benefits that the, you know, the, the payer gets, but you know, it's all kinds of residual benefits, spousal benefits and things like that. I mean, it really is extraordinary. What what makes it better than the Canadian pension system? Oh, the, uh, uh, the you know, the ability for spouses and that to get very significant payments uh, based on being, you know, just based on who they're married to, et cetera, or even who they were married to. Um well, let me give you an example. I mean, I was speaking with somebody last week, uh, an American citizen living in Canada who uh, was married to an American in the United States for, I think, the statutory requirement is 10 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've been divorced for a number of years, and she's entitled to uh, a very good percentage of Social Security payments. Damn. Just by, <laughs> just by virtue of the marriage. Okay, and by the way, this is not at the expense of the of her ex husband at all. This is just the way the system works. Hmm. And uh, you know, I mean, this stuff is 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 really amazing. It's not well known, uh, but there are uh, there are a lot of people uh, in Canada who are married to Americans who are entitled to U.S. Social Security benefits. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's, that's pretty sick. I, I definitely can, can see how the, the U S uh, social security system has some good payouts. I mean, they're, they're, they're racking up some big, 
multi-trillion dollar bills over there. So that that's good. So digital nomads not in the worst situation is is basically uh, what we need to know, which makes sense. They're they're relatively optimized, kind of jumping around the world. Um, let's move on to the expat category, which might be your your couple with, with uh, your married couple with two kids and a car and a house. And they're living in Canada, or they're living in Spain, or they're living in Mexico uh, to keep keep it on the Latin America yeah, okay. train. So, so what? So this is this is like the worst situation to be in, right? You're not retired. Are, but there's still. I think we need to be more specific. There's two categories here. Okay. The word expat um, is not the same as the word immigrant. Okay, and I want to distinguish them. An expat is generally considered to be somebody who, uh, you know, is Amer- has American roots. Uh, their financial center of gravity is probably in the United States. And what they do is they move out of the United States, you know, for four or five years or something. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of American financial people in London, for example, right? Sure. Now, these are people who are not likely at all, okay, number one, to try to arrange their money management, their investing, their retirement planning outside outside the United States. In other words, they're not going to start using the Canadian tax system or the British tax system, you know, to invest in RRSPs or ICEs in the case of it. And and in other words, they generally avoid non-U.S. investment schemes, non-U.S. assets, etc. They keep their lives centric in the United States. They simply move their bodies outside the United States, usually for employment or something like that. <clears throat> Very often, their taxes are done professionally, uh, you know, by other people, etc. And they may notice some irritations like FBAR or possibly 8938, depending. But that's really the extent of it, okay? Now, the reason is, and this is very important to understand, is there, see, see, taxation is no longer about taxation except peripherally. Tax codes are now the rules that people use for retirement planning, investing, uh, and all kinds of other, you know, all kinds of other uh, things here and there. But if somebody leaves the United States, uh, you know, for a short period of time, say under 10 years, they keep their financial center of gravity in the United States, they're not setting themselves up for the kind of, you know, punitive confiscatory taxation uh, that would apply to people who leave the United States at a relatively young age and completely integrate into the tax system and retirement planning system in another country, right? I mean, these are the ones who are finding it impossible. These are the ones who are basically forced into renunciation at this point because what you see, what the tax system in, say, Canada giveth, uh, the U.S. tax system will take. Uh, Now, let me give you a couple of very simple examples um, that are absolutely, absolutely brutal. Um. You may or may not know that it is very common for people in Canada to carry on businesses through Canadian-controlled private corporations. Uh, In fact, a large number of professionals do. And for the self-employed in Canada, these Canadian-controlled private corporations really operate as private pension plans. Okay, and that's why people do them, right, is to get the benefits of tax deferral. Now, the... I going to make one very technical comment here because I don't know who's listening to this, but under the entity classification rules, Canadian controlled private corporations are what are called per se corporations under the U.S. rules, meaning they're always treated as corporations. Now, the effect of that is that they're subject now, you know, they're subject to, uh, you know, a battery of rules that while the Canadian tax system is giving this opportunity to create a private pension plan, the U.S. tax system is attacking that and completely destroying it, okay? Mm -hmm. So these kinds of people are in the position where they basically, uh, you know, have to choose between being able to plan for retirement and being an American citizen. And really the choice is pretty easy, okay, at that point. And basically effectively they cannot 
have these Canadian corporations because it's just too much of a burden? They can have them, okay, but they're going to have to deal, first of all, with the uh, filing requirements and the regulatory stuff, which is very expensive. But it's not going to be easy for them, okay, to use those things in the way that they are intended to benefit other Canadians. For example, a few years ago, and this is what I was told, I don't have any independent knowledge of this, but, you know, instead of, you know, giving doctors a raise, you know, from the government health plan, they gave them the opportunity to create professional corporations. Okay. And this is, you know, this is a relatively new thing. The point is that by being able to run their medical practices through a medical corporation, which is really just a Canadian controlled private corporation, um, it's, you know, it's like giving them a pay raise because they're able to retain a lot more of their money. Okay. Mm hmm. But for those who are American citizens, you know, they're going to run, you know, head on into the whole subpart F guilty regime, et cetera, which makes it very difficult. You know, that's a that's a hard, that's a, a very common but perhaps harder example for people to conceptualize. Let me give you a much easier one. TFSA? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I was counseling a family about a year ago. And, you know, they had the kids there. And one of them had you know, it was like 17 and a half, just couldn't wait to turn 18 to have his own TFSA, uh, which I think is a good thing. I mean, I think the TFSAs are obviously good things, but, you know, it's an example of a tax deferred or advantaged Canadian, very popular investment instrument that will be attacked by the U.S. tax rules, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's not as simple as... Uh, as, uh, you know, they can't do it, okay. I mean, I wrote an extensive blog post on this recently showing people how they could use TFSAs. But, you know, it's it's one more example of how, you know, when the Canadian tax system or the British tax system giveth, the U.S. tax system taketh. Right. So, and and the reason all, that is is because Canada or whatever country, I know we're using the Canada example a lot, but you can sort of extrapolate to any foreign country. But Canada says something like, you can save and invest 10K tax-free per year, and it helps Canadians build a bit of a, a nest egg and helps basically incentivize them uh, investing in the Canadian stock market and stuff like that. But the, my understanding is the U.S. does not recognize this as a tax-free vehicle, and then the U.S. will want to tax the capital gains uh, from that derive from this account, even though Canada wasn't going to do it. Is that kind of... Yeah, that's right. But it's not just taxable, you know, capital gains. They're gonna they're gonna tax any income earned inside it, okay? Or at least yeah. subjected to taxation. Now, uh, you know, TFSAs are still very helpful for people at different stages of life, right? Because you know, if you don't have a lot of other income, etc., I mean, you, know, you can still make use of that because you wouldn't end up paying the U.S. tax. But the basic problem is that things that are normal and work in Canada are toxic. Uh, for America. <laughs> but I mean, the worst of all, the worst of all is, you know, middle class people, I mean, investing is hard even for sophisticated people, but middle class people, small amounts of money, you know, are inclined to use mutual funds and ETFs, right? But because these are, from the U.S. perspective, foreign, they deem them as being PFIX, which is a, a nasty word for extremely confiscatory taxation and reporting. In other words, it completely destroys it as an investment vehicle. So where that leaves Americans in Canada is that they have three ways, uh, I think, that you know they can responsibly invest, right? The first is residential, is real estate, right? Okay. Uh, by the way, America will tax the capital gain on the principal residence, okay? Which Canada does not. Exactly. Now, this is huge because, you know, anybody who lives in Canada knows that part of retirement planning in Canada is usually, well, very often for people, right? You know, this idea of uh, eventually selling a house with a huge capital gain and downsizing. That's not available to America. Canada. And this is a big problem because, you know, this is part of what it means to live in Canada. It also makes Americans in Canada, in a sense, permanently downwardly mobile people if they move, right? Because 
uh, any gains above a certain amount are subject to U.S. taxation, which erodes the money that you would use to buy another house, right? So, I mean, this is a problem. I mean, you know, I've talked to all kinds of people who were renounced just, be, you know, just for this reason, you know, because they want to sell their house, right? And they don't want to lose a, a significant part of it to U.S. taxation. And, you know, you live in a city like Toronto. Um, you know, the average house price is probably north of a million dollars. And in, in certain parts of the city, far higher. Uh, you know, so there can, and, and if people own these houses for a long time, I mean, not everybody moves every other year to, you know. Yeah, no, I get it. So most people, if they've been living in the same house for 10, 15 years uh, in Canada, or even like an, uh, another high growing market in the world, uh, I don't know if somebody named something, <laughs> but uh, anywhere, anywhere, Singapore, anywhere. whatever, and they're sitting on a $500,000 capital gain that would not be taxed in Canada or Singapore, the the U.S. wants the, the capital gains tax on that, which is what, I don't know, 15%? 23.8%. Woo! So ba- call, it, call it 25%. So if you have a 500K capital gain, the U.S. wants 125K of that. Yeah that's, exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. And I would point out that part of that tax that we're talking about is what's called the net investment income tax, which is a real scam because the way it's written into the Internal Revenue Code, that's a tax you cannot use Canadian taxes to offset as a foreign tax credit, right? So essentially, it needs to be seen as a charge of 3.8% on an investment income earned by Americans in Canada. I mean, you know, let that sink in for a minute, right? A charge, a tax of 3.8% on investment income earned by Americans in Canada. And... That's in addition to the Canadian tax. Because the way it's written, remember we talked about foreign tax credits? All right, you cannot use tax paid in Canada as a credit to offset that 3.8% tax. Now listen, that doesn't sound like a large number, but it's a very large number. Hmm. It's very difficult. It is very difficult. You know, if you're not a retiree abroad or a digital nomad uh, or an expat who's on a company plan for a few years, it is very, very difficult for American citizens to survive outside the United States while they're integrated into the tax systems of other countries. And I've only given you some examples. You know, this is aggravated by the uneven treaty network. In Australia, for example, uh, you know, everybody's required to have something called a superannuation, which basically the U.S. taxes, but it's tax-free in, 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 in Australia. And, you know, this is a gigantic problem because this is a pillar of how people save for retirement, right? But, you know, people with a U.S. birthplace living over there are going to have this huge problem. And... Australia has a very, very old, antiquated tax treaty that in no way, uh, you know, that, that was never changed, okay, to try to deal with any of this stuff. So, you know, I mean, let's say that somebody were to come to you and say, uh, well, you know, I don't like things in the United States. I don't like this or that. I want to go live somewhere. How am I going to be taxed if I live outside the United States as American? Well, the right answer to the question is, I don't have a clue. It depends what country you move to. (laughs) Okay, because, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different rules. We haven't even gotten into things like totalization agreements, which, you know, in some countries will exempt people from the Social Security, the self-employment taxes we were talking about if you're in Canada. Canada's a totalization agreement. You won't pay the uh, self-employment tax to the U.S. Uh, You know, other countries don't have that kind of agreement. Israel, I think, for example, you will. I mean, it's it's so incredibly complicated and obscene that people just throw up their hands and, and they feel that they're, you know, they just can't deal with this. Life is just too short to be an American outside. And so have you renounced or are you, are you sticking with it? 
Well, I have been involved in a lot of advocacy for a lot of years, okay? And it's very, very difficult to be involved in advocacy uh, if you're not an American citizen. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Quick break from the podcast to tell you about Language Blend, the best new way to learn Spanish. Language Blend was co-founded by Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast, decade of experience in Latin America, and Jake and his team, they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills. Because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. Look, it's it's a difficult problem, okay? It really is. Um, and I think that if people really understood it, uh, I think, you know, I think that this would become a much bigger issue, but there's a tendency for, uh, for people to define the problem in terms of how they experience the problem, which is reasonable. But that's a problem in getting change, right? Because, you know, if somebody has a mutual fund problem, they think, well, you know, if we can fix the PFIC rules or something like that, uh, then the problem goes away. No, no. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of other problems for other people, right? The only way to solve this problem is for the United States to change their definition of tax residency so that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not taxing people based on circumstances of birth. I mean, seriously, how idiotic is this? I wish, I wish. In the and, 21st and century, it's practically medieval. <laughs> and, and it also... Just it also assumes that U.S. citizenship is really a property interest that the U.S. government has in you. Mm -hmm. right? It's true. I mean, it's not like all citizenships are the same. I'm not saying that, you know, U.S. citizenship isn't a good citizenship, and I'm not saying that it doesn't give you opportunities, you know, to live in the United States, which can be valuable. But it really has gotten to the point where it's a clear disability if you want to live outside the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, lo a lot of people now are talking about how we're kind of guessing which country might be the next to implement citizenship-based taxation. Uh, Canada has talked about it a little bit. Uh, parts of the EU have talked about it, maybe Argentina. Do you, do you have any theories on uh, if... Uh, on who on if if that trend is accelerating and if other countries might implement citizenship based taxation. Well, I'll give you the answer first. I'll explain. It. I don't think there's there's much of a chance that any of them will be stupid enough to do that. Okay, I mean, you know, it really takes you know, I think a sort of blindness to what's going on in the world to do this type of thing. Now, here here's where it's getting momentum is that. Um, you know, you got these, uh, I, I mean, okay, for the record, I'm, I, you know, if I'm anything politically, I'm an independent. I'm not particularly a political person, but that does not stop me from identifying many of the Democrats as a huge, huge problem, not only to Americans, but I think the world as a whole. You know, so you've got this movement in the United States coming from people like Elizabeth Warren, you know, this whole wealth tax thing. Now, understand that the wealth tax is predicated on citizenship taxation, right? Because, you know, that means people can't escape from the United States, basically, other than renunciation, mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, they're, they're trying to ratchet that up as well. But you got to understand that, remember that citizenship taxation really is taxation based on circumstances of birth. And what the only contextual meaning it has is to allow the United States to come into other countries and effectively claim income in other countries and people in other countries as either U.S. income or U.S. people, etc. So I don't think, you know, and I think that once that sort of exposed, I don't think that the citizenship taxation is going to be the answer. But what I do think is likely to happen is... <clears throat> tightening up residency rules, right, for what does it mean to be a resident. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy to sever tax residency with Canada, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and Canada has 
a significant departure tax. It's nowhere near as brutal as the United States. Well, nothing could be. The reason the U.S. exit tax regime is so horrible is because there's two, there's really two systems. The first system applies to people who are living in the United States and decide they want to move from the United States, usually green card holders returning, you know, wherever they were from. And that system is a little more like Canada's because what that does is effectively, circumstantially, it simply looks at gains, uh, you know, usually accumulated more in the United States. But when this is applied to Americans abroad, understand that this exit tax is being applied to non-U.S. assets that were accumulated when the person did not live in the United States. Now, let me give you an example that is shocking. In fact, it's so shocking that I think some listeners may think I'm making this up. But I promise you I'm not. Okay? And it has to do with pensions. So, you know, Americans are people, just like everybody else. I mean, they may have a more oppressive government. They may be subject to draconian medieval tax rules and assumptions of citizenship, but they are still people. And as people, you know, what they they will do is they may have careers outside the United States where they will build up a pension. So let me give you a tale of two people, okay? So person A will go back to California, teaches at the University of California as a professor, 35 years, has a pension build up. I'll just make up a number, $2 million, okay? Probably not that far off, actually. Okay, but anyway. Now, the same uh, person in Canada teaches at the University of Toronto, 35 years, builds up a pension of, of $2 million. Now, the difference is this, okay, that the professor in Canada also happens to be an American. Now, let's say that both of them want to renounce U.S. citizenship. Okay, they both have net worths of up $2 million. They're both subject to the exit tax regime. Now, let's look at how the U.S. taxes those two kinds of pensions. Now, most people would assume, well, I mean, surely the U.S. must be taxing the U.S. source pension. I mean, that's where it was earned and not the foreign source Canadian one. No. Here's what happens in a situation like that. The University of Toronto professor is required to include to treat as distributed the full $2 million on a U.S. tax return on the day prior to renunciation. In other words, now understand, now this may not be a $2 million inclusion. Let's say it's 1.5, okay? But that's a $1.5 million inclusion of fake income. No money's actually been received. Tell me, would you like to have $1.5 million appear in your tax return in any year when you hadn't received any money? Wouldn't be so good, right? But let's contrast to what happens with the American one. One, okay, there is no income inclusion at all. Okay, they get to keep their pension on the understanding that sooner or later there's going to be payouts from the pension distributions. And at that point, we're going to tax that. But let's imagine that the person uh, is also a Swiss citizen, okay? or can move to Switzerland and get and become a, a resident of Switzerland, okay, in some way or another. Now, remember, after renunciation, the person is no longer an American citizen. person moves to Switzerland, okay, and now we look at the distributions. And under the treaty, okay, and under many of these treaties, basically what happens is the country where the person lives has the actual taxing rights over the distribution. So the bottom line is what I'm trying to show you here is that the pension earned in Canada is basically subject to significant confiscation. The pension earned in America may never be taxed at all by America. So the bottom line here that people need to understand, even if they don't know the ins and outs, is that the United States is the only country in the world that not only taxes people when they leave the country and set up a life in another country, but actually taxes them far more punitively in mm. ways they would never be taxed if they remained in the United States. Because they're basically disincentivizing do like offshoring as a US citizen or earning outside the US system because they want people to be kind of investing in the in the US system and transacting in the US dollar is that 
kind of the idea? Uh, I don't know that there is a clear idea. I think that that's, that's possibly a justification. I mean, let's say, say, Templeton Mutual Funds. You know, if you buy Templeton, it's the same fund, where, whether you buy it in Canada or the U.S., but if you buy it in the U.S., there's normal taxation. You buy it in Canada, it's a PFIC. I think it's basically, uh, I think it's just a, a dislike and a distrust of anything foreign. Uh, right. The United States. I mean, if you see the word foreign in the Internal Revenue Code, nobody can understand the Internal Revenue Code. But if you see the word foreign in the Internal Revenue Code, I guarantee you the word penalty is going to be within five words. And it's going to start at $10,000. So if there, there's the word foreign, there's going to be the word penalty. Is that what you said? Absolutely. But you have to understand that when it comes to the U.S. tax code, anything with an F is a problem. F bar, FATCA. But it all has its genesis in the biggest F word of all, foreign. Okay? That's where, you know, that's where all this stuff comes from. It's funny. I mean, foreign earned income exclusion is pretty nice, though. Um, you know what? Actually, it's nice for a certain group of people, okay, at a certain stage in their life. But you've got to understand that the foreign earned income exclusion applies only to a very narrow kind of income. Mm-hmm meaning earned income. It will not help anybody who's living on investment income or anything, you know, that doesn't clearly meet the category of earned income. And this is why even people who are able to use the foreign earned income exclusion, say in Canada, uh, well, I mean, I'm helping a, you know, a very, very, a person of very modest means right now in Canada uh, renounce. I mean, she can't deal with the system, even though her, Work income can be excluded under the foreign earned income exclusion. It's all the other stuff that's such a problem. Yeah, it's all the other stuff. And so uh, when we were talking about how the expats are sort of the hardest hit, it's not the digital nomads, it's not the retirees, it's kind of the it's land. The immigrants who are the hardest hit. The uh, yeah, immigrants or, or Americans permanently living outside the United States. We kind of talked about some of the issues in terms of, oh, they're going to tax you on your foreign home. They're going to tax you on foreign mutual funds, uh, et cetera. Um, we didn't, I know you said that you had a couple ideas for solutions. I feel like we didn't fully hash that out. And now that we're kind of into the, you know, the, the latter half of the episode, maybe we could talk a little bit about what some of those solutions are for Americans that want to, um, t- to basically like live uh, more or less permanently abroad. And I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off a bit. My understanding is that you should basically just continue to do all your investing and money making and payments and all that stuff in the States, even when you live abroad. So if you're living in Australia, you're living in Spain, whatever, the, I guess the idea is to keep your money in the U.S., invest in American houses, invest in American ETFs and all that, and just keep it all there. And that way it's just sort of much cleaner and and just not even bother investing in that Australian stock exchange. Don't invest in, in that Spanish house, or if you do, you know, structure it in a different way. Um, is, is that sort of the idea? Just like try to keep as much in the States as possible and that way it's less of a headache. Well, I think that works for, you know, a young person who's a digital nomad, okay? Um, I think that that can work. Um, But let's look at somebody, let's use Canada as an example, Mm -hmm. all right, who's trying to make a life in Canada. Um, You know, Canada, I don't know if you know this, but has an extremely brutal tax system, okay? So I've heard Uh, yeah, it's also a tax system that has very, you know, that has similar rules for, you know, foreign asset reporting and things like that. Now, I think that it may be that, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, realistically, aren't we just talking about short term Americans abroad? I mean, how can somebody move permanently into another country? you know, with the idea of uh, keeping their whole financial life in the United States. How would you build a credit rating, for example? 
Mm. You know, I, I, I don't think it's, I don't really think it's possible long term. I think that if you're going to do that, what you have to do is consciously avoid the things that are going to give you, you know, U.S. tax and reporting problems. So you avoid, you know, you invest only in individual shares. You invest in interest bearing notes. Okay. Only you invest in real estate, et cetera. And those are the types of things that you have to do. Uh, the, you know, if you have a pension plan, I mean, fewer and fewer people get pension plans. Uh, I mean, they may or may not be a problem, depending specifically on the treaty and the country where you live. Probably not a big problem in Canada, Germany, you know, or the UK. Uh, but a gigantic problem, you know, in other countries uh, like Australia uh, as one or, you know, any country with an older tax treaty. Right. It's a lot, you know, it's, it's really a lot of work. And but all, all those money making activities, right? whether it be buying the individual stocks or buying interest-bearing notes. Uh, what happens in that situation? I think like Canada taxes it first and then you get like a tax credit and then the U.S. will take a look at it and see if they need to assess more tax on it. Is that how it works? Well, let, let's make up a very specific example. Um, so... You're imagining that, you, that you're an American and you got a hundred dollars of interest in Canada. Is that your question? How's it taxed? Yeah, sure. All right, yeah. So both kind of, you know, so all these countries are taxing based on worldwide income. That would be sourced to Canada. Yep. So okay. Canada will tax Canada it first. Taxes you said. It first. Let's say that Canada taxes it at you know thirty percent, and uh, then what happens is it has to appear in your U.S. tax return, <laughs> and um, then. You know, if you're, you know, the, the, the tax that you would owe on that, okay, in the U.S. would be offset, all right, by the $30 paid in Canada. Right. Uh, now, in many cases, the tax paid in Canada is going to be higher than the tax paid in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the excess would go into a basket, which would be, uh, you know, uh, a tax credit carry forward. Uh-huh. Uh, there are different kinds of tax credit carry forwards, as you might expect, for different kinds of income. So for investment income, you've got one basket for, you know, earned general income. You know, you've got another basket, et cetera. But, I mean, that's in a general sense, that's how it works. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, definitely gets complicated fast, but I, I get it. So it's like if you with the way I've had it explained to me is if you live in a country that's higher tax than the U.S., you probably have nothing to worry about. But it's when you live in a, a country that's lower tax than the U.S., that's when you're going to owe more than expect it, right? Um, I think that's part of it. Okay, but the way what you're talking about, you know, the way I was explained to you kind of assumes uh, two things, okay? The first thing it assumes is that um, the income is realized, you receive it at the same time in both countries, okay? You know, there's a matching. Yeah, there's a matching thing. And the second is that, you know, they're actually taxed in the same way, okay? Now, mm -hmm. let, me give you, let me give you a scenario here for a minute, okay? And I'll show you why that doesn't why that doesn't always work, and why the you know it's funny you talk to accounts, mo many accounts, and they say, well, no, uh, you know the tax treaty prevents double taxation. First of all, it's not the tax treaty; it's the individual country's tax codes. But I mean, let's look at that for a minute. Um, that is, to the extent that that's true, that is the case when. The income is characterized in the same way in both countries and is received at the same time. Okay, but let me give you a different example. But it doesn't, for example, it's not true. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. If you know, if you sell your house in Canada, you don't pay tax in Canada. You do pay tax in the U.S. Um, I guess that's not double taxation, but it clearly is an extra burden of tax because of U.S. citizenship, right? Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I kind of get it. I guess you, it's hard to come up with an example, but it's like you get a distribution in Canada or something, and maybe in Canada it's considered 
a dividend, but then the U.S. wants to call it employment tax, and then maybe your credit doesn't count in the same way. Well, like, you know, let me give you a real example, okay? You know, at the end of 2017, uh, the U.S. created something called a transition tax. Now, let's look at these Canadian-controlled private corporations. So people are accumulating money in these corporations, all right? It's not being distributed. It's not subject to tax in Canada. The U.S. comes along and says, well, you know what? Uh, we're going to pretend that you actually received 35 years of earnings. This is true, even though you never actually received it. So the U.S. imposes tax on that right now, but that doesn't affect the Canadian tax situation. So if that stuff is paid out later in dividends, then it's then it's subject to tax in Canada. It's pure double taxation, pure double taxation. And, and this is, uh, you know, these what I would call deemed income events are becoming a bigger and bigger problem. I mean, you know, mm. the bottom line is this, to keep this real simple. Okay, anybody who tells you that, uh, you know, somehow if you live in a higher tax country, uh, that any taxes you pay in Canada will always offset your U.S. tax liability is absolutely 100% wrong. Okay, cool. I mean... That's kind of uh, our motto here at My Latin Life is don't live in a high tax country anyway. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I think, again, most digital nomads are relatively young people, generally, not all of them, but most of them. You know, I think that that works well at a certain stage in people's lives. Um, it doesn't work well for. You know, and also the word nomad means move around, right? Move around, move around. This does not work. This tax system does not work well for people who don't move around, don't move around, but rather get roots in a place and try to, you know, live their lives. Yeah. And I think uh, a, a lot of our audience is kind of uh, on, on, like, kind of shifting between being a digital nomad to being someone that wants to set up roots. Because, you know, you'll do the digital nomad thing for two, three years, who knows. But eventually, every every one of these digital nomads are like, huh, I should just buy a house in Mexico. Huh, I should just get residency here and there. And people do want to start setting up a base. And actually, what we talk about a lot is setting up multiple bases, getting residency in like five countries, right? Stuff like that. So I could... um. I could start hitting you with with some uh, some of the things that we talk about, and and maybe we could get your feedback on it because sure. you probably probably don't get asked uh, things like this too much. But you're you're obviously familiar with what a, a territorial tax country is, right? Yes. And um, so what we typically say for um, Americans and non-Americans is that instead of living in a residency-based taxation country like Colombia or maybe Mexico, that if you want to reduce your tax burden to live in a territorial tax country, right? It might be Panama, it might be Nicaragua, it might be Paraguay, things like that. Um, and then if you are American, you'd probably end up keeping most of your, your assets in the States and then just living in that territorial tax country and you're probably going to trip a lot less bugs or a lot less of these weird double taxation rules than if you were living in uh, a high tax residency based country. Um, I don't think it's the fact. You see, because of U.S. citizenship taxation, uh, the fact that it's territorial, I don't really think matters, right? I mean, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So a territorial tax system is a system uh, where a country taxes only income earned in the country, right? Right. Okay. All right. So uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, these are territorial tax systems, right? Yep. Okay. So the question is... Uh, how would that help an American under a citizenship tax based system? Yeah, basically, like, do you think at very least that uh, Americans that choose, they don't want to, they know they don't want to live in the US, right? And uh, they want to live somewhere else. At very least, choose a territorial tax country, such as Hong Kong or Singapore, 
such that you're probably going to have a much shorter tax return than if you were living in Spain or Canada and you were dealing with all these like crazy double taxation rules because uh, um, because you know a lot of your money might not be earned locally in in Singapore, and so you might not be okay. having to. Oh, point is that if you live in Singapore, Singapore won't tax any income that's not earned in Singapore. Right. And therefore, that makes life easier. Um, well, what it means is that uh, in Singapore, you're not dealing with controlled foreign corporation rules and you're not dealing with, you know, for example, having to report income from China or somewhere on a Singapore tax return. So, it's going to make the tax return in Singapore easier, right? I think we would agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me how it makes the U.S. tax return easier, though. Yeah, well, you do get the foreign earned income exclusion, uh, the foreign housing credit potentially. And so you're basically doing – it's not much, but it's something, right? So at very well, least – That's a feature, though, of, of uh, residency-based taxation. I, I mean, look, okay – I agree with you that a territorial system is far better than a worldwide system for anybody, okay? And so, I mean, there must be some, you know, there must be some sort of, you know, blowback uh, for Americans on that. So, I mean, you know, that, that's obviously a good thing. But, but what I think is that as long as Americans are subject to the citizenship taxation regime, uh, you know, the, and they live outside the United States, and they have income earned outside of the United States, if it cannot be excluded under the foreign earned income exclusion, I, you know, I think they're going to have problems. Right. But at least Canada won't try to tax it or, or whatever if they were living in, like, let's say you were like living in Canada year round working for an American company. Canada would try to tax that income as well, right? Because they'd say, oh, you're a tax resident of Canada as well. Blah blah blah. We got to tax your your income, even though it's like kind of American source, it's kind of Canadian source. It's a bit gray, right? Well, but okay. So the situation: you have an American living in Canada with U.S. with income sourced in the U.S. Or what is it you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the American in Canada is a tax resident of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. What is going to happen there, I think, is that the income is going to be sourced to Canada because that's where the work is done. Right. In other words, it wouldn't be. Um, now, the income is sourced to Canada, but that doesn't get an American out of American taxation. What it means is if the income is sourced to Canada, that you pay tax first in Canada, and then you're going to use that as a credit against the U.S. tax. Correct. And now let's say that that person, instead of choosing to move to Canada with their family, chose to move to Singapore or to Bahamas or to Panama, right? Then they wouldn't have to deal with that Canadian level of taxation, generally speaking. This is the same person who does not move to Canada but moves to one of these other countries. Yeah, exactly. Let's just say you're making half a million. You're, like, let's just say you're American. You're a uh, uh, software engineer. You're making a half a million dollars a year working for an American company. But you choose to live in Canada because you love the Rockies or you love the, the Maple Leafs, right? And you do the work in Canada. And you do the work in Canada. You'd be paying Canadian tax on that 500k right yeah yes and so kind of what we're advocating and it would kind of be the same situation in colombia or uh, spain any residency-based taxation country that you choose to move to because a lot of americans might say i want to move to colombia i want to live there year round well you're yeah. gonna have that you're gonna have that same situation of colombia saying no this is cl your your colombian tax resident and this is colombian sourced income oh for sure sure the the internal I mean maybe this will help right the internal revenue code the U.S. domestic tax code specifically sources the income to the place the work is done mm -hmm. right so anywhere an American goes right you know that's going to be income that's sourced outside the United States foreign sourced mm -hmm. in a, you know foreign to the United States right mm -hmm. so. 
you know, I think to be an American, okay, you're always going to have this problem. You, you cannot escape worldwide taxation. Um, the to be clear, and I think this is an important point. As as convenient as the foreign earned income exclusion is, it's you know, you're still a U.S. tax resident. It's just that they say, well, in this particular case, we're going to allow you to exclude this from your tax return, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like the bottom line is that I think the tax situation for American citizens who venture outside the United States, you know, it differs a little bit from country to country, you know, depending on a number of things. But they're still subject to the Internal Revenue Code no matter where they go, right? Yeah, the, the, the IRS is certainly unescapable. I guess the, the what I was trying to get you to elaborate on is that maybe you could um, reduce the burden of paperwork or taxation from the... Uh, the new country that you might oh, to. oh absolutely but that's just a function of, of the new country's tax code exactly and so what i was kind of trying to ask you about was like you know you could potentially move to a new country that has a more favorable tax code as opposed to one with a, a more uh, absolutely you know move to the middle east move to dubai okay yeah. You know, there's no income tax there at all. Then you use the foreign earned income exclusion to exclude up to about a hundred. What is one hundred twenty thousand dollars? Yeah, I, I, exactly. And that, and so in that sense, let's just say you know, moving to Canada versus moving to Dubai may, could, you know, that's that person's going to have a very different tax bill at the end of the year, even though they're both subject to U.S. tax. Oh, absolutely, no question about that. No question about that. Yeah, that that was kind of so because we were just talking about like what are some solutions that Americans can kind of implement, right? Yeah, you, yeah. You, I mean, basically, you know, what you want to do is, you know, if you want to sort of see the foreign earned income exclusion as your tax savior, so to speak, uh, you know, that just means that the foreign income is going to be excluded from the U.S. tax side. So you have to make sure it's not taxed where it's earned. Yep. So. You know, the uh, Middle Eastern countries don't have income tax. Uh, there are plenty of countries in the world with lower ta lower taxes than the United States. Um, you know, I mean, I don't have a list of them specifically, but there are. Yep. Um, so, yeah, sure. I mean, that can be done. Um, you know, the thing is, though, that... I agree it can be done, but very often when you go to places that have low taxation, you have a you know, you, it's kind of made up for in other kinds of costs, right? Uh, but anyway, I agree with your point. I agree with your basic point that you can do that. Mm -hmm. And this is a good way. I mean, look, let's say somebody's got a whole whack of student loans, okay? Mm-hmm graduate from college, university, you got a couple hundred thousand student loans. This is a problem. Okay, this is a problem. And you're not likely to be able to pay that back with a high-tax job in America or Canada. You'd agree? Takes a while. Yeah, I'm a longer than you want it around. So what you could do, get, a, get employment in Dubai, right, or somewhere like that where you can use the foreign earned income exclusion and not be taxed there. And, uh, I mean, I have personally talked to many people who saved up an awful lot of money because of that, and I think that's that's a good idea. I mean, particularly if you have, you know, as many people do these debts, right, from school. So, yeah, just help people save faster because they have a lower tax burden? Well, I think, look, I think that debt is the cancer of life. Okay. Yeah. And you know, you know, for example, I used to do all this, you know, law school counseling and stuff, and uh, you know, some of these these kinds of kinds of edu forms of education are getting so expensive. I don't know if they're worth the risk of the debt. Okay. Um. So, you know, this is a great way 
Maybe, I mean, maybe you could write an article on your website, uh, you know, how to use the foreign earned income exclusion to pay off your student loans. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely talk about it. Um, and so, uh, John, for you, when, uh, these, uh, Americans abroad come to you, I, I guess everyone's situation is a little bit different, but there must be like a couple different funnels or, or co- like categories of how people you help people. Cause I imagine you either help people renounce or you help people just get their damn taxes done, even though it's complicated or you help them like renounce, but then also maybe reduce their taxes to zero by like moving offshore or like, what are like, what are some of the categories of people that you find in terms of, who they are and what their goals are. Um, all of the above, all of the above, and it, it really correlates to, you know, I think different stages of life. I mean, first of all, to be clear, I'm not a tax preparer. Okay, I mean, I work with tax preparers, you know, to get these things done. So, you know, that is not what I do. Um, the way I think about what I do is help people transition to whatever you know, whatever stage of life they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of everything out there, right? Um, I actually do not encourage younger people to renounce U.S. citizenship because, you know, this whole thing is so crazy. I think it's got to change. It's got to fix itself. I don't know when that's going to be exactly, but I think that a lot of these people probably can wait. And remember that those who are dual citizens from birth have far less incentive to renounce U.S. citizenship, right? Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people moving into retirement uh, feel the need to renounce, and and this can be for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, a lot of it is just pure, you know, I think fear and stress. Uh, the compliance community generally, you know, accounts, some lawyers, I think, have done a very, very good job of creating a, you know, just an overwhelming sense of fear. Uh, you know, because there's so many moving parts and a lot of people are, you know, they're just frightened out of their American citizenship. I mean, I, you know, I meet them all the time. It's true. It's, it's tragic, but it's true. And yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I help people achieve what they want to achieve. And if the renunciation is what they want, you know, that's what we do. Right. And, you know, sometimes that involves planning, you know, because of their net worth and things like that. Um, you know, I mean, I work with uh, a reasonable number of, uh, you know, digital nomad types, you know, younger people who are just trying to kind of move around. And, you know, mostly what they want is, is just a better understanding of, you know, what's going on so they don't have to worry about stuff so much. Um, a big part of what I do, though, is green card holders uh, who basically have had a career in the United States or a partial career, and their job is they want to move back to wherever they came from, but they find they're, you know, they're subject to this, you know, this really brutal U.S. exit tax regime. And uh, these people can be a lot of work, right? But, I mean, I help them, you know, essentially get out of the United States without losing their shirt, uh, you know, because of the punitive nature of this stuff. Um, what else? Um you know, and I work with people all around the world, and they're and they're very different conversations depending on, you know, where you are. I mean, you know, people in Australia are living under a tax treaty that's just so, you know, misaligned with the realities of the modern world that you know, there's a tremendous degree of frustration. I think fear in Australia. Um, you know, in Europe, you've got the problem of uh, the basic identity card has a U.S. place of birth. It's a lot harder for them to not be noticed as Americans. So, you know, there's that. Um, in Canada, the, you know, the way that people run their lives is, I think, a higher proportion of them, uh, you know, have controlled foreign corporations which is a big problem. So, you know, a lot of these are, are you know, uh, country-specific issues. Hmm. But I can tell you it's very interesting. I mean, I never would have imagined that, you know, at this stage of my life I'd be doing this kind of stuff. 
I mean, this whole thing just sort of erupted, you know, 12, 15 years ago, right? As a big problem. What's the uh, the current wait time to renunciate? I know it's like often like two years or something. Um, two years would be extreme, uh, but I would say that in Canada, it's a year to a year and a half. Um, it is clear that in the um, UK, it's long. It's long, you know, probably eight to 12 months. There's some places in Europe, it's less. Uh, there are a few places in the world where you know, it, where where it's even less, but it's uh, but it's a lot of work, you know, to get to those kinds of places. And they all, by the way, you know, some of them will only take appointments from people who actually live in the country. Okay, in other words, you can't fly there. Uh, the ones that have high concentrations, though, of Americans, it's going to be a long wait list. Like Toronto is. Uh, is a year and a half. Montreal, I'm noticing, is a year and a half. I've had a number of people contact me this week with dates they've gotten to renounce in, you know, their signed dates in July and August. So that would mean for them it would have been, you know, a year to a year and a half wait. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all over the place. And, and the renunciation procedure uh, differs depending on where you are in the world as well. And, and we also probably... Uh, should mention, I don't think we mentioned that to renounce, you need to have a second citizenship. You need to have some second passport, right? Well, you're not required to as a matter of law. Okay, but you'd really be an idiot. All right. I, well, I don't, I don't want to use that kind of language. I think it would be very will, ill advised. Okay, you know, to, to be stateless. I heard yeah. they won't even allow you, like they won't allow you if you're if it if you end up being stateless. No, they will. They will. Okay, there's no uh provision in US law that requires somebody to have a second citizenship. Um that said, they work pretty hard to make sure that people do have second citizenships. But there's nothing in the law of renunciation, if you were to read the statute, that requires that. I mean, I certainly would, you know, would not advise somebody to renounce unless they had a second citizenship. And, you know, honestly, I'd probably want to know what the second citizenship was. I mean, I agree that U.S. citizenship is a problem, a big problem. I agree that it's inconvenient. But it is better than you know some you know than some other citizenships out there. Okay, I, I think the big one of the big factors is if you'll continue to have uh, access to the United States either via the ESTA program or if you're Canadian, you'll have visa free access. Because some people, like some Canadian clients, you probably have maybe they have grandparents in the United States, maybe they have some sort of business interest, and they say look, I would renounce, but I need to be able to go see my grandparents. And so they need to, they, they kind of need that. Um, uh, they need to know that even if they renounce, the U.S. is not going to treat them bad. And if they're, they're still, they still have Can Canadian passport or, or an ESTA passport, meaning like EU or Chile or something, that they can still get into the States uh, for short visits. I, I have seen absolutely no indication that that's a problem at all. Um, you know, if you were not a citizenship, you're just treated as a citizen of whatever country, you know, you, you, you are of. Now, you know, Canada is, uh, is not a visa waiver country. It's, it's far better than that. You just show a Canadian passport and that's it. You know, visa waiver countries are, you know, the UK, for example, you know, and that's where you get into, you know, your ESTA stuff. But, I mean, it, you know, it's a little more work, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a big problem. Although I would have to say that if you look at the ESTA form, it's pretty intrusive these days. <laughs> um, you know, it, it seems to me, okay, okay, maybe part of what we should talk about is who probably should not renounce, okay? Okay. Um, 
there's two kinds of people who should not renounce. And those are, first of all, those who are left with, who have, you know, who have a lot of U.S. income sources and or U.S. assets. Because at some point people die. And if you're a U.S. citizen, at present you're not going to be subject to the U.S. estate tax uh, unless you have assets of over about $12 million. That's coming down. But if you're a non-resident alien, the U.S. estate tax on U.S. CITES assets uh, kicks in as little as uh, $60,000, okay? So, you know, somebody who has uh, a lot of investments in the United States probably should not renounce or should be at least very careful with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the other people are the ones with... uh, large uh, U.S. source income payments, okay? Uh, Because when you become a non-resident alien, you're actually taxed higher on certain kinds of income, okay? So, you know, this is a conversation that you have to have with your advisor. I mean, if you have no U.S. income sources or assets, I think it's a lot easier. The other thing I would say is that... um, you know, people who want to spend a lot of time in the United States, I think probably should keep their citizenship. In other category, people who have been convicted of crime should keep their citizenship. Mm. You know, because, if, you know, if you've got a criminal record or something, that opens the door to being excluded. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, I don't really, this is not one size fits all. And although, you know, while recognizing and educating uh, on the problems of living as a United States citizen outside the United States, while this is a big problem. And I think that many of them are far better off if they do renounce and probably are forced into it. There's very definitely a group of people who are going to be better off keeping their U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, on the, uh, the thing about the U S source payments, I think that's actually an interesting one that'll apply to our audience because, um, let's just say they're, they think, okay, I'm, I'm a W2 employee now, but my skill set I could translate if I, I, I could renounce and then just be a contractor afterwards for a U.S. company and just get paid as a contractor for, for my you know, my video editing work or my software work, whatever is, could that, could that work like, or, or would that be actually even be like a higher tax payment or what are your thoughts on that generally? Um, well, you know, it comes down to where the work is being done, right? You know, it's being done outside the United States. It's going to be foreign source income. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I get, I don't have a great sort of one size fits all answer for that type of thing. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So let's just say video editor is the profession, right? You're just on your laptop. Um, you're working for a U.S. company remotely. You're video editing. You're making a hundred k. Um, obviously, you're probably doing the foreigner and income exclusion. Let's just maybe you're not, uh, but whatever. But let's just say, hey, I could just renounce the U.S. The I could renounce uh, my U.S. passport, and I can just keep video editing till the end of time, and I don't have to deal with the damn IRS, right? And and what you're saying is actually that would, even if you're getting paid from a U.S. company still for your video editing work, that would be considered foreign sort. Like the U.S. isn't going to come after that income. It's just it's like foreign the, source it's income. It's foreign um, source. Yeah, like I mean. The, the payment originates in the States, but the work was performed. Payers in the United States. I, let let yeah. me give you a, a little bit of help here, okay? If you were to just pull up the Internal Revenue Code sometime, um, or just Google uh, source rules, Internal Revenue Code, okay? You know, you'll actually yep. see, you know, some sections that say, you know, uh, you know, income and source where the work is done, or, you know, if U.S. real estate is sold, then, you know, uh, that's going to be sourced to the U.S., etc. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those rules are modified by treaties. Okay, so it depends what country you're in. Mm. 
as well. Access to the and income. Another thing I want to add on the treaty thing, okay, is this, that all U.S. tax treaties have what's called a saving clause. And the effect of the saving clause is that U.S. citizens generally don't get the benefit of the treaty, okay, except for in very narrow, narrow circumstances. So U.S. citizens need to think more in terms of the internal rules of the, of the Internal Revenue Code and less about the treaties. If you want treaty benefits, you need to renounce your citizenship. Okay. Um, and just coming back to renunciation, so let's just say um, most people don't have the the pleasure of living in beautiful Toronto, Canada like yourself, but they might, I think a lot of people are thinking, and I, I get DMs all the time saying, you know, I want to pick up uh, a CBI passport, a citizenship by investment passport from St. Kitts or from maybe Malta if they're super rich, and then uh, with an eye to potentially at least have the option to renounce my U.S. citizenship in the future. What do you think about this strategy of um, kind of like investing in second passports and then using that as a vehicle to eventually renounce? Well, I've worked with a lot of people who've done just that. Um, well, what do I think of it? Um, I think it works. Uh, I think it works. But, you know, I would... I would say the same thing again, right? That I don't think renunciation is for everybody, um, and I think it. I, I do think it needs to be weighed relatively, you know, fairly, fairly carefully here. You know, you've picked up um, a passport from one of the Caribbean programs. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it definitely gives you a second citizenship. I'm not completely up on the travel benefits it gives you. Uh, a lot of people who, in my experience, who pick up those passports all will also pick up a, a residency somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, with a view to leveraging that into citizenship. Um, but those are getting harder to get now too, right? Uh, you know, for example, the Golden Visa program that was just killed in Portugal was, I believe, a path to permanent residency, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, but the digital nomad visa, I don't believe is. Am no. I right on that? Uh, I think, well, the D7 one is, but uh, I don't think, but g digital nomad visas typically don't lead to permanent Yeah, right. Residency. So, I mean, the thing is, you got to be very, very careful with this stuff, okay? Um, there's a great personal injury lawyer many years ago. His name was Mo Levine, the greatest trial lawyer ever. and. Uh, you know, he used to make these closing arguments in front of the jury, and he'd always end up saying, it's not what you take from somebody, it's what you leave them with. And I think this does have some applicability here, okay? Uh, you know, what are you left with, right? You know, in terms of mobility and stuff like this. Now, if I understood correctly, I was listening to a seminar this morning. I'm a member of uh, something called the Investment Migration Council. and. Yep. I think what I heard the, the part of the discussion was that a number of European countries are considering changing rules to make uh, holders of, of various passports around the world less mobile within their jurisdictions. Um, I wasn't totally paying attention, but that's what I thought I heard. But my point is there's no reason they can't do this. So, you know, I do think citizenship matters. I really do. Um, I also think that U.S. citizenship has value, but for some people, do they just cannot maintain it. I mean, it's really that simple. Um, I think that people should be thoughtful about, uh, you know, any CBI programs they get involved with. Um, I mean, you know, it's nice to have a passport, right? But, uh, you know, is it really consistent with other things you're trying to do? If all you want to do is renounce U.S. citizenship, I think that's fine. It works. Um, you know, there's been tremendous shakeup in that the world of second, second citizenships in, I think, the last year or so, right? Yeah, you for know, sure. The industry, there are far fewer options than there used to be. Um, isn't Malta either done or on the way out on that? 
Uh, Malta's still kicking. They are, are they? Okay. All right. Um, but, you know, uh, in the last few months, okay, these weren't necessarily second citizenships, but Ireland has killed their, you know, their program. Portugal yep. killed part of it. Yep. Uh, you know, et cetera. I mean, the, the trend on this is, uh, you know, is to make it an awful lot harder. And, you know, the reasons for this are, are kind of interesting. Um, you know, the... What they're trying to, what they're recognizing is that in some cases these programs are actually harmful to the, you know, to the longtime residents of the country, right? You know, you you sell off real estate, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the Airbnb thing, the whole COVID thing, interestingly, has made people more mobile. Mm-hmm. You know, that seems to have uh, supercharged these digital nomad visas. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think what we're seeing is the you know, a certain um, uneasiness with this whole concept of, you know, being able to sort of buy your way into a country, whatever. What I do think is this, that there are more people who are able to get second citizenship based on ancestry than I think know about it. True. And, you know, anybody can get, you know, Italian or Irish citizen absolutely should, absolutely should. Uh, you know, it's amazing how people will not do this. I mean, I've had this conversation with so many people. They don't want to do it. I don't have time. You know, are you out of your mind? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, people I mean, people will pay a million dollars for a U.S. green card. I think it's a huge mistake to do that. I think they should come to the U.S. in another way. There's a reason it's called a green card, kryptonite, right? Uh, but, you know, the point is that people will pay lots of money you know, for the kinds of opportunities that are available to a lot of people for free. You know, and I'll come back to, you know, my personal view of the postgraduate work permit in Canada. You know, I mean, why wouldn't a middle-class American family, wherever, in upstate New York, you know, they know where Canada is. You know, why wouldn't they just send their kid to college, university in Canada, you know, get the probably pay less or possibly pay less, but, you know, it's setting them up to be able to get Canadian citizenship. You know, or back where we started, you know, shouldn't people consider having their kids born in Mexico? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think that these are very prudent things. You know, and while we're talking about renouncing U.S. citizenship, it's also, you know, at least I believe it seems clear to me, that, you know, generally speaking, the value of these citizenships is becoming more clear and I think even greater, you know, because of, you know, we're living in such an unsettled world, right? Yep. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, this is good citizenship talk. This is this is a lot of what we uh, we talk about every day at My Latin Life uh, on the Twitter. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's good stuff to talk about. Uh, and I think that... Uh, you know, if you were to go to my Twitter feed, um, today I put up something. You know, I found this really, really interesting conference on, uh, you know, sort of wrongfully assigning or attributing citizenship to people I thought was interesting. Okay. Uh, you know, have a look at it. I mean, that's sort of looking at the whole citizenship thing from another point of view. But the bottom line is this, Okay. For most people, you know, they go through life and citizenship, they don't even understand what it is. I mean, 98% of people in America equate citizenship with residency. It's true. Well, that's why they don't understand citizenship taxation, because they think, you know, if you're a citizen, you live in the United States. That's what they think. All right. And this is why, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to have this, you know, this kind of discussion. But I will say this, and this is a direct quote from me out of a so, you know, somebody I was working with today is that once citizenship problems start, okay, there is no small problem. You know, it's it's impossible. And uh, you know, to the extent that you're able to get some of these things for little effort, Ireland, Ireland's got more citizens living outside Ireland than in Ireland. Mm-hmm. 
you know, or Italy or, or whatever. I, you know, I think people really need to do that. I, I, you know, that's where I think there needs to be more emphasis and less on, you know, uh, buying these, uh, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, Caribbean programs. And I'm not saying they don't have value. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, probably Irish or Italian citizenship is probably better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, that's not, you know, I'm not saying anything particularly controversial, right? Yeah. And so when it comes to residency, you mentioned that you're seeing a lot of your clients are interested not only in the, the CBI, but also getting second residency. So in your part of the world and, and with your client base, what are you seeing as some of the most uh, most popular second residency options? Um, I think I don't I don't know about popular. What I've seen is people I know reasonably well who've moved to Portugal, who've moved to Mexico, um, probably Spain. Just people I'm not thinking about right now. Uh, France is a great place for Americans, by the way, because of a you know an aspect of the tax treaty people don't know about. Oh, I didn't know that. Tell us. Oh, this is unbelievable. It's incredible. Um, well, basically, okay, if you're a U.S. citizen living in France, uh, as a general rule, you're not going to be taxed on U.S. investment source income. What does that mean? What it means is that your neighbor, you can have the same, that, that your neighbor, okay, he's a French citizen, has the same investment in court portfolio that you do is going to pay higher taxes living in France than you as an American citizen. What it, what it does is it, um, it may, in some respects, it may lower the tax on investment income to, you know, very modest levels. France has very high taxes, okay? Uh, you may or may not be aware of that. Very high taxes. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why anybody would live in France unless they've always lived in France. Unless you're an American retiree, in which case you can waltz in, show your U.S. passport, and get tremendous taxes. That's pretty cool. Well, it is, but, you know, you've got, you know, you've got to be able to, uh, you know, make that kind of residency option work. So, you know, it's, God, it's not one size fits all. Uh, and a lot of people put almost no thought into it because, you know, I know people who are so upset about the tax situation in Canada that all they're doing is just severing tax residency with Canada, paying the departure tax, and they hardly care where they go. You know, as long as there's, a, you know, a way to fly somewhere where they need to do business or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, I, global mobility is interesting. I, it, I really is, it is interesting. helping people achieve these things. I mean, you know, it's fascinating stuff. Um, but I don't think that people, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I think they always undervalue what they have. Uh, you know, particularly if it's, uh, Oh, I don't know. Well, you know, living in Canada, I think, is undervalued. Um, Canada is actually a great place to live if you've got a lot of money. <laughs> no, seriously, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, you get taxed brutally on the way up trying to get it, but once you've got it, I mean, it's uh, it's a good place to live. Yeah, that's fair. I think I think a lot of the value is in diversity and just uh, diversification and having multiple residencies, multiple passports, having basically having a plan B. Okay, so you're, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, uh, I, I mean, I agree. Or as uh, people like, you know, I mean, a lot of the people who you know spent are sort of full time advocates of this stuff. Um, you know, they characterize these things as insurance policies, right? Yep. And I agree. I agree. I think they, I think they really are. I, I think that um, 
And this is why I think that people, you know, there's something about the human condition where if it's complicated and expensive, it must be a good thing to do. <laughs> if it's simple, oh, anybody can do that. So why would we bother? I, I have an opposite view of this. If it's simple, you should do it. Okay? You know, if you can get citizenship by ancestry or if you can, you know, do your schooling, whatever, in Canada. You know, these are great investments. But it's yeah. hard for people to, you know, appreciate what's simple. I mean, every year, these companies, like you presumably know companies like Henley and and that, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, Henley and the IMC, the investment money, you know, they have these huge conferences, okay? And and I've been to these conferences, right? I mean, you know, as I told you, I remember the, the IMC. But, you know, there's always this focus on all this, you know, these big, expensive, elaborate things. And, you know, for U.S. citizens, they're a lot harder to access because of the tax problem. They focus on EB-5 programs. I think anybody who'd go to the U.S. on an EB-5 thing is certifiably insane. But, you know, they don't, that's just my, I, I, I emphasize that's my opinion and therefore it can be wrong. But I have, you know, if you look at the tax problems, I mean, you can see why. So you think that some of the IMC uh, organizations and, and people there, they're focusing on the wrong parts of global migration? I don't think they're focusing on the wrong parts, but I think that it would be worth devoting more time to things that are easily available, like citizenship by ancestry. You'd almost get the feeling it doesn't exist. Right, because they don't, they don't want to – it's not, like, lucrative for them to help people with the layups. Well, I guess that's true. You know, I'm sure that's true. Um, yeah. Okay. That, that's, yeah. What, that's why they don't really you talk about Mexico and Paraguay. You do that. And, you know, in your, your group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's definitely truth in that, but I'll tell you also where there's a, a very, very serious weakness in the industry. And that is that, you know, it's one thing to talk about, you know, you can get this residency program or this citizenship. But once you've got it, you've got to figure out how to actually get there, okay? And often if the issue is tax, that involves severing tax residency with a high tax place, maybe the United States. Maybe Canada. Spain has exit taxes now. Japan has exit taxes. Australia has exit taxes. Yeah, they, they talk a lot about how to get the new thing, but not about how to exit the old thing. That's right. That's right. And that's usually the, the bigger problem, okay? It's a gigantic problem. And, and I think another area of emphasis has got to be, you know, you go to these countries, what are the... What kinds of treaties do these countries have with other countries, including tax treaties? Mm. Right? You know, and I think that a lot of people, um, not so much in your group, because my sense is, I don't know you, but my sense is you're dealing with a younger demographic. Um, I may be wrong, but that's just my impression. But, you know, for people with, you know, are sort of middle class, middle age, you know, who have started to acquire assets, they've got to figure out how to get the, you know, how that how that stuff is going to interact with this kind of move. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, there are, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've received a call from somebody who moved to Canada that taxes anything and everything. I mean, Canada and the United States are probably the world's top two, you know, confiscatory tax systems, okay, <laughs> for different reasons, okay. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like they're like the, they're like the center of the tax axis of evil. Okay, um, you know, and this and this is well known. I think uh, you know, in general, it doesn't mean people don't live in these places, but but it is a reality. But people have got to spend more time trying to figure out how exactly they're going to facilitate these moves. I hundred percent agree. And a lot of people they pay very significant departure taxes to leave Canada. We've talked about the U.S. exit tax. Well, Canada invented the concept of the exit tax. You know, I believe it was the first country from you know in nineteen ninety six that had an exit tax. Oh wow! 
That's yeah. crazy. Speaking of uh, exit taxing or exiting, uh, we're, we're coming up on time. Actually, we got less than uh, 60 seconds. So, uh, John, do you have any uh, final message that you want to share with the audience? Of course, I'm going to link up uh, all your, your websites and everything in the show notes. Oh, I think try to determine what makes you happy in life and focus on that, and then the rest will fall into place. I like it. Too short for you? I'll leave it at that. (laughs) No, I love it. I love it. This has been a a super valuable episode. Another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, our guest today was John Richardson, expert for U.S. citizens abroad. Thanks again, John. You're very welcome.